Chair. Call Denise Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to thank you for part two and possibly part three um, of this bill in the Committee of the Whole House. Sir. Um, I think uh, I'd like to comment on some of the uh, some of the issues that have already been raised, um, and I'm particularly concerned by the tenor uh, of some of the com comments from the New Zealand First Speaker and also the uh, the Speaker who's just resumed her seat, which is about the issue of problem gambling and problem gamblers. I do seriously believe that we need to move away from pathologising uh, the person who is gambling and direct our attention at what is essentially a dangerous product. Now this bill does talk about minimising gambling harm and that therefore it recognises that gambling machines, particularly in class four, uh, class four uh, venues, are dangerous. They are a dangerous product. So when you blame the person who's using the product, you're actually letting the people who reap the benefits of the machine off the hook. And I think we need to accept that there are mechanisms that we can put in place and we should be putting in place that can make gambling on pokey machines or electronic gaming machines much safer. And this brings me to the supplementary order paper that we are putting forward uh, uh, under uh, the name of Kevin Haig, which talks about introducing real-time player tracking and uh, pre-commit cards uh, to all gamblers. And what this would do is that it would give an absolute assurance that anybody who is even starting to display behaviour that looks like it may be getting out of control can be, uh, can be taken aside straight away and, um, and can absolutely minimise the harm that would happen from gambling. It's like having seatbelts in a car and an airbag. It would make the product safe. However, we need to recognise that this is an industry that is washing in money. There's $2.09 billion was gambled, was lost at gambling in uh, the 2013-2014 uh, financial year, sir. DIA, Department of Internal Affairs, suggests that around 40% of that came from class four gambling. That's the gambling and pokies and clubs and pubs. Now, as one of my um, uh, colleagues in the House who previously, previously spoken said, that money in class four gambling is specifically for community purposes. That is the only reason we can have clubs and pubs with pokey machines in them, because that money does have to be distributed to the community. And um, it's one of the issues that I think has been quite problematic um, since the uh, since the start, the time that this bill was introduced, and actually bef the, one of the underlying reasons for why the, um, uh, the the first act was introduced in the first place, the distribution of those funds is constantly subject to rorts and disgraceful conduct. And we just have to see that quite recently, a multidisciplinary um, uh, investigation involving the fraud office, serious fraud office, the Department of Internal Affairs and the police has resulted in the arrest of four people who are associated with the racing industry um, over um, uh, what, what could probably be considered a money go round in terms of the grants, uh, the grants that come from class for gambling. Now I recognise that the bill does talk about um, Racing being a, um, a purpose, a community purpose, or where money can go from, uh, from class for gambling. However, I think we should recognise that we are, if we allow that to continue, and we have an SO pay that actually puts a cap on the amount of money that could go to racing purposes. If we allow that co to continue, we're essentially allowing one form of gambling to subsidise another form of gambling, and. I don't recall ever racing or racehorse owners being a charity, a registered charity, which is where this money is supposed to go, sir. So we support strengthening uh, transparency around the distribution of funds. 
Um, I also just want to touch on the fact that um, there has been, Mr. Chair, yeah. Mr. Denise Chair, Rose. thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to touch on the fact that we do need to strengthen our problem gambling um, and host responsibility uh, reform in this country because um, we've still got the situation where, even though there are requirements under the Act and strengthened, presumably, in this bill for host responsibility um, programs to be in place and notices to be put up uh, in, venues, um, in venues where poking machines are, are being played. Frequently, um, the host responsibility is not being monitored or even, uh, or even uh, adhered to at all. And we can see that in um, the evidence of that and the sting that the Department of Internal Affairs operated at the end of last year. Essentially, they set up a mystery shopper type of scenario where um, uh, mystery shoppers went into classical venues, uh, and not just, well, gambling venues, and sat at pokey machines and sat there for, for considerable time and said things like, and I quote, the amount, um, and said things like, I meant to go home to the kids, but another few minutes won't hurt. Or, I can't really afford it, but I think I'm, going, I'm getting close to a win. Or, I need to go, but I need to win, win some money back. They displayed uh, distress while they were sitting there, and they did this in front of the staff. They, they checked and did this in 102 different venues. And do you know what? 101 of them ignored that problem gambling displays. I think we can say, sir, that the industry is not complying voluntarily with problem gambling harm minimisation, and that, sir, is why we need regulation. And that, sir, is why we should actually ask the Minister to accept the supplementary order papers that Kevin Haig is putting forward that would make the machines safe, that would eradicate completely the issue of problem gambling, because the seat belts and the airbags would work. Mr Chair, I also want to touch on the issue of problem gambling in casinos, that poker machines there. In um, the beginning of the year last year, in 2014, TV One uh, showed a, an article where they had sent a pensioner into the casino in Auckland at Sky City and said to that person to stay there and gamble for as long as it takes before someone comes and intervenes and notices that you've been sitting there. That pensioner stayed in front of that pokey machine for 14 hours before they left. There was no intervention whatsoever from any Sky City staff. Now, as a result of that, sir, I wrote to the Department of Internal Affairs Gambling Compliance Unit and asked that they investigate. I made an official complaint. In July, sir, six months after the original incident, I received a notice from the Department of Affairs uh, a response saying that basically they were working with Sky City to improve their host responsibility practice. Now, sir, if we think that this is the type of um, censure a venue is going to get for um, flouting the law, then we are seriously, seriously irresponsible in the way we're making our laws because we need to have regulation that brings these organisations, these companies and these trusts into line. International uh, evidence suggests that 40% of all the money that is lost on pokey machines, so that's 40% of the 40% of the $2.09 billion that was lost in gambling last year, 40% of 40% of that basically comes from people with limited control over their gambling behaviour. No, that's actually... That, yes, no, that's from pokey gaming. That, yes, that's what I said. 40% of 2.09 billion is uh, what was lost, according to the Department of Internal Affairs today, that's what was lost at class four gaming venues. So 40% of that, Mr Mitchell, uh, is what was came, came from problem gambling, um, problem, problem gamblers. So 
if we consider that that's an awful lot of money going into the coffers of both the trusts and the venues, uh, and in the cases... Call David Clark.